Hello, my name is David Hicks. Whether you are listening, whether you're watching, thank you so much for doing so. May this podcast, this video bless you, and may you be able to take this blessing and share it with others. We've been talking about what is hell, what is God's wrath, what is the day of judgment? And so in the beginning, the first thing we looked at, our anchor point for this whole series, we'll see it again today, is that whatever these things are, Jesus can deliver us from them. We can be saved from them if we put our faith and our trust in Jesus. Again, we'll see that today. Then we took a lot of time to do a deep dive into the wrath of God and trying trying to understand it. Why? Because it's foundational to the other two. It helps us understand the day of judgment. It helps us understand hell as we will once we start talking about them. So that's why we spend so much time on it. But the main thing we learned is that God's wrath is so extreme because his love is so extreme. It's the love-hate relationship, the love-hate principle, whatever you want to call it, where when you deeply love something, it is valuable to you. You cherish it. You're passionate about it. Then you can't stand what's opposed to it. You can't stand its anti-value, if you will. Or if we're talking about a person or a group of people whom you love dearly, you can't stand it when someone comes along and they persecute and they harm and they do evil things to that person or people that you love. It's the love-hate principle. When love grows for something, hate grows for its opposite. And the same thing applies. If hate is what's growing as a natural reaction, love will grow for its opposite of whatever is being hated. So the last thing we talked about in our last video and podcast is this weird thing where God describes himself as a jealous God. It's weird because most of the time, jealousy is pictured as a bad thing that we need to put off. It, it's, it's not listed as a fruit of the spirit. It's listed as a work of the flesh. In other words, it's listed as something sinful to discard, get rid of, keep out of one's life. But there is a concept of a godly jealousy. To, to explain that a little bit more, in godly je- jealousy, I would say, to try and understand it, it, it's a justified jealousy. It's a jealousy that is true, that is merited. But it's also something that we as humans, we have to kind of keep in check. Now, I'm getting off on a tangent. I don't want to get off on it. So let me just back up for a second. God describes himself as jealous. Why? Because he is our father who loves us at all costs. He is our father who loves us at all costs. We are his sons. We are his daughters. When we abandon God, our Father, and worship other gods, whether literally or symbolically. Think money, power, sex, etc. And we put those in place of God. We put those on such a high pedestal. There's, they're as every bit as high as God should be in our life. It stirs up the spirit of jealousy within God because it's like, Children who abandon the parents that love them and go pick some strangers that look fun to them and say, hey, why don't you be my parents? And then the parents who love us have to see us watching around, walking around with these strangers, treating, treating them as if they were our mom and dad. So yes, it's a justified jealousy that God has. And his love for us is so extreme. It hurts so badly when we Abandon him for other gods. How extreme is it? God so loved the world, John 3, 16 and 17, that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus' mission wasn't 
to come here and to condemn people. His mission was to save them to the point and what it took to save us is that he had to be tortured and to tortured, abused, abandoned, even by his own father, God, his own father until he died. He took the punishment for our sin more on that later. All right. So God has an extreme anger. Now, we need to understand the next thing. What is Judgment Day? What's this whole day of judgment thing about? Okay. Judgment Day is the final day of life here on earth. It's called the last day by Jesus, by those who are learning from Jesus. Now, what's going to happen on this last day? We're not going to get into all of it, but first of all, understand there's going to be a resurrection. We'll read from John chapter 11. The story in John chapter 11 is Jesus, is that of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus had three good friends. I'm sure he had others. You know, his disciples were his friends. But these three lived in Bethany. It was two sisters, Mary, Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. And so Lazarus got sick. So they sent word to Jesus so that he would come and heal Lazarus. They knew he could do it. They've seen it. They'd seen him do it. They had a complete faith in Jesus. If he would just come, lay his hands on Lazarus, just speak the word, whatever, Lazarus would be healed. So they send to Jesus for help. Jesus gets word that Lazarus is sick, the one he loves, and he does a very curious thing. Nothing. He, he stays where he is, keeps doing what he's doing with his disciples. And then finally, after Lazarus was dead, Jesus told his disciples, we're going to go see him. Lazarus is sleeping. His disciples didn't understand what Jesus meant. And so Jesus had to explain to them that what Jesus meant was that Lazarus was dead. Now, I want you to hold on to that metaphor because for those of us who put our faith in Jesus, learn his ways and follow him, death is pretty much sleeping. It's not something to be feared. It's not something to dread. It's not something that is, you know, the end of our existence. It's just spiritual sleeping is, is a great analogy for it. So Jesus takes his disciples and they go. And Martha, Lazarus' sister, by now Jesus been, Lazarus had been dead four days. Martha hears word that Jesus has arrived. So she runs to him, goes to him. And uh, this is the conversation that follows. John chapter 11, beginning at verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. What a beautiful statement of faith. In the face of her brother dying, she still tells Jesus, the one who could have saved him, I know even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Your brother is going to live again. That's what that means. He has not ceased to exist. He is going to live again. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha had learned this truth from Jesus, that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? 
She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. That's the kind of faith we need to have in Jesus. Now let's wrap our brains around, a little bit around what he said, because it is confusing. He says, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. But then he turns around and says, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, which is it? Well, no, it's not an either or thing. We need to understand what Jesus means in both contexts when he talks about death. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Though his spirit may be separated from his body, that's what death is. Even though that happened, uh, happens like it did with Lazarus, he'll live. He's going to come back to life. But truly, when we live and believe in Jesus, we will never die. How's it, how, can it, how can both be? Because the second time, we're not talking about the, the point at which the spirit leaves the body, which the point at which the soul exits the body. We're talking about the true meaning of death, which truly, when you get to the heart and soul of what it means, it's separation. It's separation. When we're spiritually dead, we're separated from God. We're separated from Jesus. We are not citizens of his kingdom. We're outcasts in a, in a manner of speaking. We're outsiders. We're separated from our Father. And that's an alarming state in which to be separated from our Creator, separated from the Son. Not being a part of his family or his kingdom. But when we live and believe in Jesus, we will never be separated from them. Never. And so Jesus is asking Martha, do you believe this? And she did. She believed Jesus was the Christ, meaning he's the anointed one. The, the one who is given the mission to come save mankind. And not just that, that he is literally the son of God. So, what did she say, and what did Jesus not rebuke her for saying it? I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. At the last day, the final day, people will rise from the dead. And I say people because it's not just those who follow Jesus who will rise from the dead. We'll go to John, um, in John chapter 6, if we have time, we'll come back to it. This is, you know, Martha, how did Martha learn this? that there's going to be a last day and a resurrection. Well, Jesus talked about it several times in John chapter 6 that he would give life to those who put their faith in him on the last day. If we get time again, we'll, we'll get to it. It is uh, one of the longer passages. But let's look at John chapter 5 and start at verse 19. Now, to give you the context the vast majority of the crowd is, is hacked off at Jesus. They're mad at Jesus. Why? Because Jesus had the audacity to heal somebody miraculously on the Sabbath day and then to tell that person to take up his bed and walk. Now, the Sabbath day is the day of rest. Not supposed to do any work. So not only did Jesus do work, quote unquote, by healing somebody on the Sabbath, he told that person to pick up his bed and walk with it on the day of rest. Oh my goodness. How dare he? So they're mad at Jesus for having done that. Now, verse 19, Jesus addresses the crowd. Then Jesus answered and said to them, uh, there's another reason that the crowd's mad at Jesus, uh, by the way, and I'll throw that in there quickly since I'm talking about it. Uh, I'll start at verse 16. That, that'll help it make sense. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. They were so mad at Jesus, they wanted to kill him. 
But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. He's calling himself the Son of God. The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Side point. Oh, if we open our eyes and ask God, help, us to, help me to see what you're doing, you will see the works of the Father. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. Okay, I got to stop for a second because I got this story in my head that I feel like the Spirit is convicting me to tell you. Recently, I was I was in a group of people, uh, a, gr a group of uh, believers, worshipers, and the one who was leading us was... How shall I say? She was doing this, this thing where she was praying, calling on God, and then she'd speak with in tongues, put her do her hands like this on somebody, and that person would fall down. Okay. And I was seeing this, and I asked, I prayed straight to the Holy Spirit. I said, Holy Spirit, is this you? Now the voice I heard in my head. Well, I mean, I heard my own voice, okay? It didn't sound like anybody else, but the thought that came back to me after I asked this was, no, this isn't me. And so then I said, show me where you are in this. And I was prompted to look at my wife, Heather, who was sitting beside a friend of hers who was hurting who needed comfort. That's what the Holy Spirit showed me. Basically, he was saying, that's where I am. In the person, in your wife, who is trying to comfort her friend. That's where I am. If we open our eyes and we ask the Father for help and direction, we'll be able to see the works of God. Just like Jesus was saying, I, I see what he does. And that's what I do. All right, so let's keep going. Verse 20. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Okay, this is our first reference to judgment that we've come across. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent me. Look, it does not matter how much we say we we love God, we think we love God, etc. If we refuse to honor Jesus, we're not honoring God. We're not honoring our Father. We must put our trust in Jesus and encourage people around us to do the same. Verse 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Do you, see, do you hear what he's saying? We go to Jesus. We hear his words, implying that we believe his words. And we choose to follow them, to obey them, to trust them. And we believe in the Father that he was sent from the Father. We're skipping judgment day, so to speak. We're skipping judgment. Let me put it that way. And we're passing from death into a state of separation from God and Jesus 
into life. What's the opposite of being separated from them? It is being in communion with them. Now we are not separated. We have fellowship with our Father, fellowship with Jesus. We are citizens of the kingdom. We are members of the family. Because we chose to put our faith in Jesus and to trust that he was truly sent from God. Sorry, I got distracted. It felt like there was a bug in my neck and I had to like, I've had to stop the video, edit it. Okay, where were we? Verse 25. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now think about that. He's saying the hour is coming and it's right now. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. He's not talking about the resurrection on the last day in this passage because he's saying it's happening right now. And we know that there were days after this day in which Jesus taught. And so what he's talking about is those who are spiritually dead in that state of separation from God and Jesus. Who listen to him, hear him, put their faith in him then God is going to forgive them. He is going to save them. And they are going to change from that state of being separated into that state of communion and fellowship with God and the Son. Spiritually dead, spiritually separated, hear his voice. Now they live. Now they live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Now we're talking about that last day. Now we're talking about that literal resurrection. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of of condemnation. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So, what's going to happen? All will be raised, both good and bad, on this last day. And for those who put their faith in Jesus, it's going to be a resurrection of life. It's going to be a wonderful resurrection. But if we don't, if we refuse, if we rebel, if we live by our own ways and not his, and do not turn, then it's called by Jesus the resurrection of condemnation. Condemnation implies judgment. On this last day, there will be judgment. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 42 to 50. Well, in John chapter 12, to give you the con, well, it's, it's simply, <laughs> the, the whole gospel of John is a lot of Jesus' teaching. You get more of Jesus simply talking than any of the other gospels. And so I highly encourage you to read it. But we'll start at verse 42. Uh, there, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. Many believed in Jesus but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. The Pharisees were a religious sect among the Jews. They were the strictest of them all. And they had political power. They had authority. You did not want to get on their bad side. And so even among the politicians, the rulers, whatever you want to call them, a lot of them believed in Jesus, but they wouldn't say it. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess them lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They'd be disbarred from the synagogue, from the, the place of worship. And it just had all sorts of negative cultural implications being disbarred from the synagogue. Obviously it did because they were afraid of that happening to them. Verse 43, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They gave in to cowardice. They gave in to fear. Because they feared getting kicked out of the synagogue. They feared this group, the Pharisees, far more than they feared God. They wanted, And they wanted to be praised by men instead of being praised by God. 
Do not let your heart be like theirs. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. When we see Jesus, we're seeing God himself. When we believe in Jesus, we are believing in the one who sent him. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now, a couple of things here. I want you to hold in for a second on this phrase. I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. In John 3, 16 and 17, we already saw that God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And now Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world. He didn't come to judge. He didn't come to condemn. He came to save it. As followers of Christ, it's not our job to go around judging and condemning everyone. It is our job to spread the news of how they can be saved, to share the good news that they can be saved from the judgment and condemnation that is coming. That's what Judgment Day is. The day in which judgment and condemnation actually arrives. That day isn't today unless it just happens to come after this moment. Today, the time is to spread the good news that people can be saved from that day that's coming by putting their faith in Jesus. I do have enough time to read verse 49 and 50. Jesus said, For I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father's told me, so I speak. Jesus is saying, I am giving you the words of my Father. And guess what? His Father is your Father. He's my Father. He's our Father. Jesus was telling us the words of our Father. All right, where are we going with this? Next time. We're going to ask ourselves, why judge mankind, though? What's the point of having a judgment day? And we'll go from there and, and see if we can go beyond that. Thank you for listening. God bless you. God bless this recording.